In this new program of the series Looks on Public Participation by the directors of the Innovative Teaching Group Di Paso of UNED, Marta Lora Tamayo and Antonio Lopez Pelaez, today we will be understanding why it is necessary to create mechanisms to boost the public participation, why there should be legislation forcing public participation to take place before a plan is approved, and what the legal consequences are if there's an improper action by a competent authority in a territorial urban plan. Esther Rando, professor of administrative law at the Malaga University, will be talking about this and many other topics in this interview with Marta Lora Tamayo and Antonio Lopez Peláez. They are both professors at UNED. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on when you are listening to this program. Welcome to the new show of the Looks on Public Participation series carried out in the framework of the participatory group, an agreement between UNED and the City Council of Madrid. Today we have a very special guest with us. She's coming from Malaga. Like Antonio Lopez, my colleague. How are you doing, Antonio? Good morning, how are you? Good morning, Esther Rando. Hello, how are you? Esther is also joining us in Madrid because she's carrying out research here, apart from directing together with me a project on super municipality. We are carrying out other activities about urban planning and public participation. One of these activities is precisely this radio show. Where can I start? How do we create a city, the territory of tomorrow, the space that we want to live in? As jurists know, and today we will get serious about legislation, it has a legislation reflection through urban planning and land use planning. Increasingly, and thanks to the different movements of public participation in existence, even the participatory group, specific spaces for citizen participation and public participation are opening up in decision-making processes about what the city will be like in the future. Yes, that will be talking to us about the amazing case of Malaga. These are very complex processes and uh, they never lack pathologies, challenges, judicialization of problems. So today we will be talking a little bit about the pros and cons of public participation, how it is being channeled and how legislation collects or not the interests of citizens through the expert perspective of our beloved Esther Rando. Thank you, Esther. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Malaga is everywhere. We love uh, to do that publicity for uh, Malaga, for those listening from abroad. But anyway, for the people listening to us, with regards to the participatory group, there are jurists, but other participants too. So my first question is, how could we explain to our listeners clearly what an urban plan is and what a land use plan is. How can you introduce this so that we can get to the depth of the conversation straight away? Well, I have uh, to briefly start by thanking the City Council of Madrid and the UNED University for this interesting initiative and also the professors who are here with me today, Marta Lora and Antonio Lopez. And if you allow me, I would like to thank uh, Marta in particular since I'm carrying out this research project uh, with her. She's amazing in administrative law, an amazing human and professor. And uh, yes, she is a beloved person for me. To answer the question asked by Antonio Lopez, it's important to start with these concepts. We often confuse land use planning and urbanism or urban planning, or the difference is not clear between these two concepts. It's true that urban planning has to do with territories. Yes, there are legal ordinances before the constitution. We already had a soil act and then there was an act in 76 and 1977, but land use uh, planning as such was a competence introduced by our constitution and it's the competence of autonomous communities. It's important to explain this nuance. Article 149.123 collects these two competences on the one hand land use planning and on the other hand urban planning. But 
these are two separate things in terms of planning colloquially we could define urban plans as what has to do with the urban order of municipalities towns villages but from the local perspective establishing a classification of soil local systems but always within this perspective bottom up but territorial plans are top down it can be super local or coming from a group of municipalities the territory has specific targets to meet so that uh, we can preserve spaces use spaces in a specific way just to give you an example i always say that uh, territory or land use planning has that bird's eye view thank you for clarifying this i wanted to make another clarification because this distinction that we make in spain between land use planning and urban planning is actually something that doesn't translate to the Latin American context. Many members of the participatory group come from Latin America and they use these two terms as a synonym of each other. So in order to start this program, I think it's interesting to make the difference. Having said this, it's true that within the participatory group, traditionally, territorial entities with competences to approve these kinds of plans, both in terms of land use and urban plans, they've always been very technical and bureaucratic. They've been designed by territorial entities and public authorities. What is your perspective? How have they collected the perceptions, interests and wishes of citizens for the future of the cities and towns. Tell us a little bit about this. Well, that's true, Marta. Urban and territorial plans have always been made by the competent authorities, whether that is municipalities or in a case of territorial plans, the autonomous communities and citizens have always intervened once the plan was drafted. And basically they've been informed through public information, but it's about a step, a bureaucratic step collected in the different regional authorities. There's an obligation, a duty to carry out this step in order to approve an instrument, but not before that never before that and this is what we understand as citizen participation the prior participation of citizens even before the plan itself is drafted that's where we understand that public participation and citizen participation should take place and when it can really be useful citizens are the ones that know the weaknesses problems challenges and opportunities in every territory or in every space and a word that you are saying their wishes the wishes of citizens are a key generally they haven't been reflected in plans how interesting to have this conversation because in urban planning and in cities many stakeholders intervene with different interests and apart from the competition for limited resources and defining what's yours what's mine how i can make the most of everything there's strategic planning and a part of designing the city of the future and how i can gradually turn difficult to solve problems into opportunities to really improve the city in the long term so participation today is about co-design and highlighting the demands needs and trends shown by citizens from the get-go from the start because if it's just about making amendments at the end the space for participation is limited it's about a sanction to what has already been done on the part of an expert so we basically going back to a hierarchical structure where experts and people in charge decide and at the bottom you've got citizens basically informed at the end to give their consent so how do you think we should adapt participation to solve this and what do you think about strategic planning and participation well it's true that we have made a lot of progress. We are moving forward from the legislation point of view. Many legislation pieces force or make prior public participation mandatory. I mean, prior to the drafting of the plan. So we are moving forward. We have certain benchmarks, just to quote some. The Canary Islands, Catalonia, even at an organization level. 
There are different pieces of legislation in Navarra too with the participation plan. In the Basque country, they've got a planning council where they have this type of program. Same thing for the Valencian community. This is a huge step forward for those working in the judicial sector. We know that if there's no legislation, if things are not mandatory, they never happen. With regards to Antonio's words, it's a sentence that I say a lot. Daily practices tell us that uh, the reality, I mean, can be exemplified. Yes, we see a repetition with a frequency that is a bit uh, undesirable, that it's true. We have to create mechanisms not only to collect, but to incorporate them in legislation, to create mechanisms to make participation of citizens easier to boost it to encourage it but it's also very important to raise awareness between the citizens or even teach i would dare say so that they can participate in a more effective manner and a more global manner they should participate in territorial models city models without putting the finger so to speak in a particular concern. That is what will help us achieve and count on the effective participation of our citizens. Thank you very much, Esther. I think it's very interesting, the field that we are discussing today, because I think that procedure-wise, on today we're getting very serious, very technical, but this has to do a lot with legislation, with standards. We need to understand legislation well so that citizens don't get frustrated. As you were saying, traditionally, participation was focused on basically informing citizens, and this is something that we have talked about a lot in our radio shows, the scale of participation and how it kind of stops at the first step. It's just about informing citizens. That's not participation. The second and third steps of these stairs would have to do with what I do, with the peels. Traditionally, participation has been understood as the right to complain, to throw a tantrum. And this leads to a misunderstanding, as you were rightly saying. This is what the participatory group is all about. It's about conveying a new dynamic of participation, how to create a more horizontal governance. It's very difficult in such a technical field as urban planning. Technicians are skeptical to the intervention of citizens, too. I believe that you have cases and examples examples where autonomous community legislation is getting serious with participation and this has judicial consequences. Tell us, how can the judicialization of these conflicts, I mean, how does this lead to judges saying, hey, we need participation, it's key. I think that it's difficult for us to adapt the really participatory Latin American model. So tell us how legislation educates us and the obstacles involved. Tell us about the process. Well, I think this is a very pertinent question. Frequently, there's still a confusion between public participation and public information. It's true that these two terms are better defined increasingly, but the difference between these two concepts is, I mean, it's difficult for people to use them differently. Public information is a step in the process to pass any instrument, that's all. Just to give you a reference, the, the ruling on the 5th of May 2015 by the Supreme Court, it's not a mere plan, but it's key because of the impact that these have in, in the lives of citizens. We need to understand the context about law 39-2015 and its article 83 talks about public information. Definitely, it's about exposing to the general public, not only the interested stakeholders or the impacted groups, but the general public, the content of an administrative document, then it has to be consulted and everybody can express their opinion if they formulate the appeals that are relevant, that is considered in the second paragraph of Article 83. But the administrative process law is a facultative step, a voluntary step. In some sectorial laws, and this is what happens in urban planning, we are before a perceptive 
process and the formulation of a corresponding process. As I was saying, it's a step, but it's key. Public participation is fundamental. If we go back to the decade of the 90s, it's there's an interesting decision by the Constitutional Court in 95, and it talks about democratic participation. This ruling was interesting because it recognizes public information and the process to approve any urban plan and the participation point of view. The participation of citizens is also seen in 2017 in the Constitutional Court. Administrations need to choose freely, but always after hearing the, the allegations of citizens. It has been highlighted that the differentiation factor telling the difference between direct democracy and the third genre that is called participatory democracy by the constitutional court is precisely the binding nature or at least in terms of proposals whereas direct participation i mean the intervention of citizens is binding participation intention is not mandatory but different legislations consider it. I mean, there's an intention to get to know the opinions of citizens before making a decision by the competent authorities. In relation with what you were saying about the importance of public information as a process step in order to create urban plans and territorial plans, I would like to provide you with an example. Since there are two people from Malaga here, the land use plan at sub-regional level at Costa del Sol approved in 2006. There was an appeal before the Supreme Court of Andalusia in 2015. If I remember well, on the 6th of October, there was a decision by the Supreme Court declaring it fully void and null. There were two reasons, in both cases formal aspects as you know well, and I say this for the listeners more than anything, they are considered regulations and they have general character. So any flaw in the way that they are processed has the same legal consequences, making it fully null and void. It happens, unfortunately, with many urban plans and territorial plans. But in this case, there were two reasons that led to this decision from the court. It was very interesting because it had a particular vote. That's very interested. It's interesting. But it was the lack of response to allegations presented in the public information stage. You know well that any plan, I mean, we can have more than 100 allegations received. Not responding to these allegations can lead to an appeal by the interested party, get to the Supreme Court like it did. And the decision back then was that since there was no answer to the allegations, the right to a hearing had been violated. And this determined that the plan was fully null and void. I think this is an amazing example, not responding to allegations. It's almost 10 years later. It was approved in 2006 and the allegation was made in 2010. So we're talking about legal uncertainty. And this is another debate that we are holding about the problems presented by the multiple urban and territorial plans that... Uh, are declared void ab initio because of procedural matters like the example I've just highlighted. I can provide you many others. Thank you so much, Esther. You were talking about two topics that I find fascinating and that we have mentioned a lot in the participatory group. First of all, this uh, participatory democracy model, it's not a direct democracy, but instead participatory democracy strengthens our democracy model which is representative democracy what's sad about this is that it has to be a judge 10 years later telling the city council or territorial entity that they've done things wrong 
But it's fascinating the fact that there was an exposition, a written evidence of this idea in a judge ruling. I love the example of the Costa del Sol case. There was an absence of answer to an allegation. And some people might say, well, it was just a mistake. It was a formal procedure, bureaucratic step. But as Alvaro Cerezo says, it's not about uh, ticking a to-do list. That's not compliance. It's a deep matter, the lack of a formal process implies the structural lack of a way of creating cities and that is the way that we need to, to work and there's another topic there I don't know if uh, Antonio Lopez agrees with us from his perspective of social intervention how in many cases judicialization of all these processes could be avoided if there had been a participatory process that was real, tangible, beforehand, because there would have been consensus by really listening to citizens and this would have avoided judicialization, appeals, etc. Let's conclude with these kind of reflections. Where should legislation go? How do we raise awareness? What do administrations need to change to make cities in a different way? I totally agree with Marta and Esther. I think that consensus is legitimized through public participation. It allows us to deal with obstacles that are very significant, both immediate but strategic matters. If we know the citizens' desires for the city of the future, it's much easier. It's not about specific programs we are creating. In terms of 10, 15, 20 years, we're defining our spaces. Once you've built buildings, it's difficult to change things. There's a footprint there. The footprint of urban planning is eternal. So segregation or inclusion of areas, things like that, the way that itineraries that you walk through are built, paths, etc., connecting, detaching areas, this has a long-term effect. Just to finish, we like to always end with a positive note because it's a radio show and because the participatory group is about having fun, we say. If you had to summarize the main advantages of public participation processes that you've seen in your trajectory and we've seen many of the problems but what advantages do you see how would you encourage our listeners to participate in a more inclusive way and to really achieve that social consensus i totally agree with what you're saying antonio marta it's about encouraging people it's about making citizens feel that they participate that they know about the plans often they have no idea that plans are being drafted sometimes it's the media telling them in a biased way, sometimes as a political weapon, and this has very serious consequences. We need mechanisms to enable and to make public participation effective. And on the other hand, we need to encourage effective participation of citizens from the scratch, from the get-go, from the time that a plan a prospect of approving a plan is agreed on. We need to make them create the design of the territorial plan, the urban plan. Let's not forget, as I was saying before, that citizens are the ones who know the problems and opportunity better, the needs of an area. And this has to be reflected in the plan. That way, I understand that citizens will feel part of the process and it will be perceived as something essential. It will be perceived as legitimate. If people feel represented in plans, it will be much easier to turn them into a reality. And avoiding the judicialization that we were mentioning and achieving the desired model. So let's act in that double direction. Apart from many other matters that are necessary to count with citizens that participate effectively that uh, express their voices, their problems, needs, and see the reflection of these and the plan. And yes, feel involved, 
feel a part of it. This will definitely provide legitimacy to the plan and this is key to create the model of urban planning that we want. Why do we participate? Because we can't detach ourselves from our future. We need to build our cities together. Thank you very much. This is your home. I mean, you are now at unit in the best department in the administrative law one. So that's phenomenal. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here with you. Let's meet in El Rincón. Well, it's been a luxury, a pleasure to be here with you too. I'll see you soon let's keep fighting to build cities as we want with participation and we are seeing s steps that are small but significant thank you for your invitation thank you to the uned university to the city council of madrid and i congratulate you for the wonderful initiative of the participatory group thank you